Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Mahdisi Street podcast. My name is Usama and I'm joined as always by my brothers Sari and Karim. Special thanks to our producer Sina Rahmani who reminds us all to tell all our listeners and viewers to please subscribe, like and give a five-star review if and when you can to whatever platform or on whatever platform you are listening or watching this show. You can also support the show by signing up for our Patreon subscription. The link uh, for which is in the description below. Today, uh, July 16th, we're delighted to have with us uh, Tara Ali, who is, of course, uh, an extraordinarily famous Pakistani-British political activist, writer, novelist, journalist, historian, filmmaker, and public intellectual. Tara Ali has been deeply critical, as everyone who, who knows um, anything about the new left, uh, has been deeply critical of imperialism, and of the domestic despotisms in places uh, like Pakistan and analyzes them all together. He's a member of the editorial committee of the New Left Review and contributes to The Guardian, Counterpunch, the LRB. He studied philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford, and he's the author of many, many books, including um, the one you know that many people know is, of course, The Clash of Fundamentalisms, Crusades, Jihads, and Modernity, which came out in 2002. He's also the author of The Obama Syndrome uh, and also uh, of The Extreme Center, A Warning, which was published in 2015. In 2020, Tara Ali was a member of the Belmarsh Tribunal, organized by the Progressive International, which was investigating and evaluating war crimes committed by the United States government in the 21st century. And for his sins, apparently, Tara Ali has been spied on by the British government for decades, but he persists in offering all of us a deeply critical and uncompromising reading of power, political economy, and the world. So Tara Ali, thank you so much for joining us here on Mahdisi Street. It's been very good to see all of all three of you together. I've met you individually, but never as a collective. Well, it's our it's our pleasure. So the first question and the customary question that we always begin with, Tara, is the question of biography. How did Tara Ali become the Tara Ali that we all know and respect and admire today? It was essentially in Pakistan. I was brought up uh, in a family, the bulk of which was sort of feudal and uh, quite reactionary, or let me be deeply reactionary. Uh, but my parents were both radicals. Uh, and uh, literally, uh, it was great being in the house where uh, I was and being brought up in that atmosphere. And the first two acts which showed that I was political at quite a young age, one was when I was still at school. I was 16. And I read a tiny item in the newspaper saying that a young American, black American, Jimmy Wilson, was about to be executed, had been sentenced to execution for stealing a dollar. And we couldn't believe it at school. So I said, we can't just not do anything. So we organized a tiny demonstration. And about 20 of us marched from the school to the American consulate in Lahore, where we were met by a hard-nosed Protestant white American who showed nil sympathy for us at all, took our names down and said, I'm going to write to your principal. I was, you know, a student in a Catholic college run by Irish missionaries and suggested he expels all of you. That was my first encounter with American democracy. You know, absolutely no sympathy. The second, um, briefly, was some years later when I was at college now, again in Lahore, in Pakistan. And we read in a tiny news item that Patrice Lumumba had been assassinated. So I was then very active in the students' union. I called a meeting, and we assembled about two, 300 students who came the same day. And Pakistan was under military rule, and all demonstrations were banned. And I said, come, hello, high water. We're not staying indoors today. We are marching. So uh, I remember that demonstration well because I organized it, and we didn't know how it would go. So we marched to the U.S. Embassy 
because as I told my fellow students, I have absolutely no doubt, and we'll get the proof later, that the CIA is behind this killing. And so we marched to the U.S. Embassy. The uh, police and army were caught by surprise. It was a totally spontaneous demonstration. And on our way back to the college in the university, we started chanting slogans for democracy and against the military dictatorship. So those my, were my two first acts, and I have I really have not looked back since then, even when I left that. So my political life and education took place in a third world country in Pakistan. And I think our demonstration in defense of Lumumba was the first anywhere in the world. Even India, which was a democracy, had huge mass parties, didn't organize one. And the West caught up much, much later. So, Tara, so that, that's a that's an extraordinary sort of sense of a beginning of a narrative. And so, how how would you describe sort of? We'll, we'll start broadly and then then zeroed into the, the situation in Gaza, the genocide in Gaza. But how like how would you summarize your your sort of your experience and trajectory over the last several decades? What's different today from where you began? Uh, you know, in a, in the sense that. You've said there's faint hope. I was reading something you wrote recently in Mideast Eye. There was faint. The mask is off, and there's faint hope. How is there? How is the mask off more today than it was when you started demonstrating against the U.S. Um, in the in in when you were a schoolboy in Pakistan? Well, the mask is off in the sense that no one uh, who's intelligent, even though they may be on the right, they know it secretly that the United States today runs the world, that it disregards all the institutions it itself has created in order to protect and preserve what it uh, claims to be its interests, and that human rights, uh, democracy, etc., have uh, very little to do with this. I mean, I was lucky I learned this in, in Pakistan first, where... Uh, it was pretty obvious. And then when I came to study at Oxford, the Vietnam War had proceeded. It was beginning to start. American troops were beginning to go in. And, you know, when I look back, I have to be honest, as someone from that region, I couldn't think about anything else. It's like today, many of us can't think about anything but Palestine and how it's going to end. It was the same at that time with the Vietnam War. I said, oh, they're going to kill people. The bombings have started. And uh, so we set up a Vietnam, Oxford Vietnam Committee, which carried out the first demonstrations outside the U.S. Embassy in 1965, before 68, three years before 68. And uh, in that same period, I'd written a letter to the Observer attacking the war. And I got a letter back, not from the Observer, which did publish it, but from Bertrand Russell, saying, I've read your letter in the Observer. I liked it very much. Come and have tea. So I went to have tea with him. And he said, you know, how he'd set up the Peace Foundation, uh, and how they were going to have a war crimes tribunal composed of public intellectuals, independent-minded people, to try the U.S. for war crimes. He said, we will, of course, invite them, but I don't think they'll, they'll attend, he said, <laughs> with a slightly sarcastic inflection. So I got very involved in that and went to Vietnam in 66, 67, for three months, uh, traveled all over the war-torn country, saw the bombing of, early bombings of uh, parts of Kampuchea, Cambodia, as it was then. And that really was a formative event for me. Uh, it formed me because we saw everything that we are seeing in Palestine today in Vietnam all those years ago, the killing of children. You know, I was in a complete state. We were meant to take notes and prepare reports for the tribunal. 
And seeing so many children being killed every day, I couldn't concentrate. And the Vietnamese would pat me on the back and say, Comrade, we are fully aware how you're feeling. But please don't take this badly, what we're going to say. Once you've been here for two weeks, whether you like it or not, you'll get used to it. We have for years. It's an awful thing to be told, but it was true. You know, you it's not that you didn't feel, but the initial emotional reaction and the tears which poured out, that stopped. And, it, it, you know, we I traveled everywhere, saw bombed churches, bombed hospitals, bombed uh, ambulances with the Red Cross sign on them, saw civilians lying dead on the ground. So that... Uh, <clears throat> That had a, a, a huge uh, impact on me. And it was then that I realized, because just before I left for Vietnam, uh, no, it was after. It was after. Sorry. I, I, um, so when I came back from Vietnam, we did this report. A war crimes tribunal had been organized. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Bertrand Russell were the founders of this tribunal. Lots of people from all over the world came. They wouldn't let us hold it in London under a Labour government. They wouldn't let us hold it in France. Even General de Gaulle said it's too much of a provocation for the Americans if we do this. We're opposing the war. Uh, finally, Sweden with a social democratic government and Olaf Palma as prime minister said, you, we can have it here. So that's where we, uh, that's where we ultimately landed up. And some of the witnesses that we brought over from Vietnam, young children displaying their bodies, the coverage in the media was uniformly hostile. They interviewed us, but it was uniformly hostile. So what has happened in relation to Palestine is much, much worse, because here they don't even allow us to challenge the official narrative. At that time, they did allow us to challenge the narrative, because we had Russell, we had Saab, we had uh, lawyers from Latin America, from Pakistan. from So they couldn't totally deny them a hearing. But they did, uh, uh, by and large, present uh, uh, present uh, 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 the official uh, pro-U.S. view. These days, if you say, oh, we were all against the Vietnam War, no, you weren't. You learned how to be against the Vietnam War when you were defeated, not before that. Uh, so, th th you know, that then took up quite a lot of my time, and I couldn't concentrate even on my on my uh, exams at Oxford. I just said, I can't think about this. And so my friend said, you better get, you know, get a degree at least. I said, why? You know, how many Vietnamese are getting degrees at Oxford? And so in every single paper, in politics, philosophy, and economics, in response to every single question I brought in Vietnam, and uh, there was a question which I'll never forget, which was, um, what is the cheapest form of subsidized transport in the world? And I said, it's the helicopter service from Saigon in Vietnam into the jungles, which is, of course, free of charge. But the problem is that sometimes the passengers can't return. And uh, uh, later on, my uh, one of the tutors who'd marked the papers grabbed me on the streets. Two, three. He said, I know what your aim was. You wanted us to fail you. Uh, so then you could say, look at Oxford, how reactionary it is. And for that reason, we decided not to. We gave you a degree. Isn't that what you wanted? I said, I wasn't even thinking about it. I didn't care whether you failed me or passed or anything like that. So that was, you know, from Pakistan to Oxford, Oxford in a period where Vietnam had become the dominant cause in in the West, in the United States, and of course uh, all over all over Europe. And that and then you know we set up newspapers like the Black Dwarf and the Red Mole. Uh, 
later on Mick Jagger, John Lennon got involved in the movement, distributed stuff, wrote things for us. So it was a very broad movement uh, that we created, which had a had an impact. Big difference, I was, I was thinking with now, is that the movement is getting broader and broader. But the political atmosphere in all these countries in Europe and the United States, you know, what can we say? It's awful. Whereas at that time, there are big attempts to change the system. And the official authorities were incredibly, uh, incredibly nervous uh, about what was going on. So we, it, you know, it was a very different world we lived in. Uh, whereas today, it's it's of a different sort. But the one lesson to summarize all this, guys, the one lesson I learned was that American imperialism was the enemy. This was, you know, other powers behaved badly. You criticize them, but this was the enemy of all progressive groups and people in the world uh, because of how it operated and because of what they did. I mean, in the in that period when this before the Soviet Union had been um, uh, had imploded, if you look, they hardly ever used the word capitalism. The word they used was freedom. Freedom was the synonym for capitalism. Once that world collapsed, capitalism, now they're very proud of it. You know, yes, our system won. At that time, they didn't dare use it. That's, in a, you know, briefly my... Before I move on to Seti, who I know has a question for you um, about Zionism, um, the question I have following up on what you just said is, why is Palestine worse? You said, you mentioned, is it because the governments, as you said, are more reactionary today? But you said earlier that people learned to be opposed to the Vietnam War. So given the fact that there was a movement, given the fact that people learned to be opposed to the Vietnam War, why is Palestine so much different? I mean, we're in 2024. I know. I know. I think uh, the reason is that politics itself in the Western world has degenerated to such a degree that the democratic system has become so hollowed out uh, that the only way they can come to power within their own parties, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, whether it's Labour or Conservative, is by making sure that they keep supporting the leadership and the power of the state and the so-called interests of that state. I mean, you know, you can just make a simple comparison. When we had the big marches on Vietnam, Labour MPs used to ring me up, literally, and say, hi, Tariq, are we allowed to come on the demonstration? I said, welcome. And we used to have 30, 40, 50 MPs, members of parliament, marching with us, trade union leaders coming with us. Uh, and on Palestine, even the handful of leftists who weren't expelled from the Labour Party were scared. Why were they scared? Oh, you know, it's dangerous. We didn't want to be accused of anti-Semitism. We, but, you know, it's the same thing they called us, communist agents. Why don't you go back and live there? And all this sort of stuff went on even there, compared to which anti-Semitism is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, another uh, sort of uh, term of abuse designed to put people off. But, no, that is what has shifted. And you look at the United States, it's the biggest change. In the Vietnam years, the U.S. Senate Foreign Com uh, Relations Committee under Senator uh, William Fulbright had hearings on Vietnam, which we used to watch here. They were put on the television in Britain. Sharp, sometimes vicious questioning on U.S. state and government officials as to what the hell is going on in Vietnam. That educated a whole generation of liberals who moved away and became activists in the movement. And here, um, that had an impact too. Compare it to today, where they've given a virtual green light 
not virtual, a, a real green light to the Israelis to do whatever they want, both Senate and House of Representatives, and this uh, most of the uh, House of Commons, barring a few small parties and individuals. They've done exactly the same. Do what you like. I mean, the current and the newly elected prime minister in Britain supported Netanyahu just as the genocide began. They have a right to cut off water. They have a right to cut off electricity. They have a right to starve Palestinians. And this guy is being celebrated in the liberal press today as, you know, a, a great new prime minister who's going to bring about change. That's the big difference that politics is. Uh, it, it's become trivialized, vulgarized, and they would really not, they would prefer not to have democracy altogether because they don't see it as hugely beneficial to them, you know. But that's uh, what you're saying. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's, it rings so true what you're saying, especially given the recent election in Britain, given the, the rise of Starmer and David Lammy, who's now in Tel Aviv taking his orders or just was there. I mean, that, that seems you know, indisputable. But what would you say to those people who say, yes, but the, the level of popular mobilization has changed in the sense that, in the sense that alternative media are, have much more currency now, especially for young people, compared to the mainstream media, which remain now as as back then. In fact, I think if anything, it's something you read, I read by you recently, you were talking about how, you know, there were there were very, very sharp criticisms in, for example, I think you referred to CBS News in a recent piece during the Vietnam War, you know, that there, there, there actually was, that the mainstream press was capable of, of criticism of state policy back in the 1960s and 1970s. But in any case, the shift, part of the shift that we're seeing now, and one of the explanations that people give to the, to the shift in popular mobilization in our time, especially on Palestine, is the rise of alternative media, social media, and so forth. So what credence would you give to that? And, or are you saying, in fact, that given that, you know, that, 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 that power itself in the Western capitals can't, seems not to be Seems to, it seems like it can't really be captured on on behalf of a, of a genuine opposition. Yeah, I, don't, I guess yeah, I'm not really formulating a question, I suppose. But you see what I'm saying? Like on on the one hand, can we put any faith in the rise of of youth mobilization, student mobilization, which doesn't depend on mainstream media accounts, and, or is it it or do, or or are we really talking about power, the need to capture power in the way that it was that that was you know formulated in the 1960s and 1970s? Sorry if that's a bottled question, but I hope there's No, no, some I understand clarity. it. Yeah, yeah. I think basically two things have happened. Uh, even in the British election, the sophologists, the top sophologists in the country are now explaining how this is the lowest vote ever in a British general election with universal adult franchise. That Starmer got, as far as the popular vote was concerned, fewer votes than Jeremy Corbyn did in 2017 and 2019. Uh, the people in power, Starmer's uh, gang, uh, say, oh, no, well, so does that matter? Well, it does matter if you take democracy even a tiny bit seriously. The fact is the first-past-the-post system in Britain is geared towards helping parties with a minority of the popular vote and making them into majorities. It's undemocratic. That's why uh, uh, they, they succeed in doing it. Between 60 and 70 percent of the British people, whenever they have been asked, have said they want an immediate ceasefire from October, November, last year onwards. That's what they say. That's what people in France say, even in Germany, uh, which is completely done and, uh, you know, about turn and it's now Zionism, Zionism, uber alles, uh, that these people, uh, even there there's opposition. 
And in most of Europe, there is opposition to what the, their governments from whichever party are doing, and they'll pay a price for that. Now, I think there are two reasons why it's happened. One is that there's a general disaffection in the recent generation. There's a distrust of politics. You know, the way they've run the countries economically, for instance, it doesn't make any difference which party's in power. And that has alienated young people from politics. On Palestine, there are two reasons. One is that, I mean, I remember speaking at Palestinian demonstrations since the beginning of this century, for God's sake, whenever they bombed Lebanon, whenever they bombed Gaza, whenever they made raids, there were demonstrations. They were not huge like they are today, but people came out. And I think slowly, what we didn't have in the 60s and 70s on Palestine has happened that a certain degree of political consciousness on this question has entered the heads of the last two, three generations. And this is the first time it has come out as it has. I mean, the demonstrations in Britain, the uh, encampments in the United States are much bigger than anything that happened during the Vietnam War. I mean, apart from the Kent State killings in 1972, when they shot two students dead in the U.S. <clears throat> but in, uh, in terms of numbers and anger, uh, it's much, much greater. I mean, Britain, we've had, you know, 12, 13 demonstrations now, national demonstrations with almost a quarter of a million people uh, each time on the streets, then regional demonstrations, citywide demonstrations. People are just really both angry and fed up and feel helpless. And, you know, of course, modern technology is extremely important in that, that they don't have to rely on images from their own television network, CNN and BBC World. They can see Al Jazeera if they want. They can see completely different images and reports coming from Al Jazeera. They can have direct images coming from uh, the scene of the genocide. They can see what politicians are saying, which is not reported on the media, and that is a huge step forward. I don't think we can, uh, we should underplay that uh, for whatever reason. It shouldn't be underplayed. This alternative means of communication, which they will try and control in some way, sooner rather than later, has had a very big impact on the new generations. And I think one of the things which one has been struck by, both in Britain and in the US, is the number of young Jewish kids coming out who never would have done that before. I mean, the, the, the occupation of the Grand Central in New York, the uh, marches organized on campuses, the confrontation of politicians. So what this has meant is that Zionism comes out into the open and says, oh, you're not really Jews. To be a Jew, you have to be a Zionist. And that's the biggest sort of instance of anti-Semitism that I've seen in uh, in, in in recent years. I mean, you know, my own knowledge of Palestine didn't come through books because there were very few books around in the 60s. It came around when Burton Russell sent me and others to uh, talk to the Palestinian refugees after the Six-Day War, which we did. I did. So I traveled all over the Middle East talking to Palestinian refugees. And uh, I just dug out a photograph for my new memoirs, which will be out in October, of a young Palestinian child lying in a refugee camp in a cage. They've covered her to prevent flies and other things getting at her, and she's been burnt by napalm. The same, the same chemical weapons they were using in Vietnam at the same time, roughly, were also being used by the Israelis uh, against the Palestinians to drive them out during the Six-Day War. So 
that's what got me uh, uh, engaged. And I then you know, slowly started to read whatever one could. But it's taken a long time for this realization to sink in to the heads of the new generations that what we are witnessing in, in, in Palestine is a colonial war. That was resisted for a very long time uh, because of the Judeocide of the Second World War. Uh, people said, well, maybe it is, but you know, they've suffered. And uh, it's taken a long time to people say, for people to say that one suffering doesn't justify uh, another and what is happening is appalling. I'll give you one example. I was invited 10, 15 years ago to speak at a conference of psychoanalysts in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And um, they said, could you speak on the world situation? So I said, yeah, sure. Uh, and I spoke on, on Palestine. You know, which they were very nervous when I started doing that. I could see from their faces, there was, what is he going to say? Is he going to step out of line? <clears throat> and I said, one of the things I said was quoted a, a poem by W.H. Auden. Those, I said, you know, we know that the Jews of Europe suffered at the hands not of the Palestinians, but a Western, so called Western civilization, of which Hitler was a part, whether you like it or not. And um, I said they suffered, and they, you know, six million were uh, uh, wiped out. And now their political successors, people from that period, are behaving in the same way to the Palestinians. And I quoted the Orton verse, those to whom harm is done do harm in return. It's a fairly straightforward remark, quite honestly, but you know, quite a few of the French psychoanalysts walked out in protest, wanted my remarks to be eliminated. Uh, this was voted against. No one wanted that. But that was my first confrontation with a refusal by many, many Zionists to Zionist sympathizers. Which year was this taught it? Um, I can't remember, Usama. I think it must have been 20, 2003 or 2004. Uh, I thought it was in the 1960s or 70s. No, no, about... no, 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 no. It's after 9-11. That much I, I can you know, remember. And and this is what happened. And then in the hotel, because we were all staying in the same hotel, when uh, they saw me entering a lift, they would the lift was empty. It was just me. They would wait till I departed, which I suited me, to be honest. But And then they would come up on the next lift to the dining room. So then I realized that France, France was a, a, a special case where they just could not accept that this is what their own people or people they identified were doing. Tara, I want to you, you've you've drawn this very kind of compelling uh, argument that things have changed now, and these kind of mass protests have kind of come back and showed Palestine or Palestine solidarity in a, in a different light that. That you know, I think provides some kind of hope if we're going to look for some hope somewhere. But I want to go back because uh, you've also connected to the 1960s in your own experience and in all your writing, of course. Is the question of, at least in those days, I mean, you did have something called the Global South, so you did have some kind of interstate structure. I, I'm, I'll leave aside the Communist Party, but sort of the Global South, uh, you know, India and, and all these other countries that were that were. Uh, that saw Palestine as an anti-colonial, or at least you know, was one of the, the kind of the, the main issues was the anti-colonialism in general and Palestine specific, um, and and even you know, of course, we've 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 seen a lot about how Mandela, when he comes out of prison, you know, he says we can't be free until Palestine is free. So this, you know, that kind of represents that that global south moment, which you know was coming to an end at that point, but there was that some kind of interstate solidarity. That was not just a question of people, but also states. So, so that that's changed over these years. How do you see that 
change. And, and you know, when, when we look to the global south today or what, you know, what I don't know if we can still call it the global south today, you see India, you see countries like this that are, you know, if officially India has become very Zionist state in its own kind of way or supportive of Israel anyway. Um, you see countries like Brazil that kind of go that are going back and forth today. They've been very supportive under Lula with Palestine, but not, you know, this, not, not like they've been doing very much beyond words. So how does that shift? How do you see that shift? And, and does that make a big impact in, in the solidarity movements? Yeah, I think there has been a shift in both directions. India, we've lost. India used to be the most pro-Arab nationalist country in the global south. Uh, and after the British, Israelis, and French invaded Egypt to try and topple Nasser, Jawaharlal Nehru, India's prime minister, came out very solidly for him. Whereas Pakistan, officially and in reality a Muslim country, uh, supported the British. So it had little to do with religion, which people, you know, overestimate most of the time. <clears throat> and that year, 56, 57, the most popular name people gave to their sons in Egypt was Joharlal after Nehru. Uh, that was the degree of that's gone because we have a semi-fascist government uh, in India, which has been targeting the minority populations, especially the Muslims. Uh, there have been pogroms, people have been locked up, non-Muslim journalists defending them like Arundhati Roy, but not just her. Others have been victimized. So it's a very unpleasant uh, situation in India. And I was interviewed by an Indian uh, magazine, Frontline, this year, early this year. And I said, Delhi is the only capital city of note where there hasn't been a single demonstration in solidarity with Palestine. They couldn't explain it. I said, I'll explain it. It's Modi. And it's the fact that the two big communist parties, which were amongst the strongest in the global south, have just disappeared. They can't even organize a token demonstration. You can't even get a few thousand people on the streets. Whereas if this had happened before Modi, most of the Indian universities in Delhi, um, the Delhi would have been out on the streets and in other parts of the country. So it is a, it is a grave loss, both uh, politically uh, uh, and ideologically. On the other hand, Kareem, you posed this question correctly, but Compare this to the South Africans who have gone out of their way to challenge the West in, in all their courts. I say their courts because these are Western institutions created by the United States largely or under its, with its support and pushing basically to attack their enemies. That's what their function was. But when their main ally in the Middle East starts on a genocidal course and starts doing what it is, the laws don't apply to them. And they don't apply to the United States or the uh, Western countries which are arming and stoking this genocide. And in this situation, what the South Africans did was very good, actually. Um, and uh, I'm just in the process of writing a, a sort of nine cycle musical play on this collaboration between the Palestinians and the South Africans for early next year, um, you know, just to stress this. And, to, and then the other thing is Latin America. I mean, you know, they haven't done much in terms of, uh, but the Bolivians and the Venezuelans broke off relations, which is more than the Arab states have done, if we're going to discuss that. Chavez, before he died, was rock solid for Palestine. Uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia was rock solid for Palestine. Even the Chilean guy who's a moderate has come out for Palestine. One reason for that, but only one in the case of some of the leaders, is that there is a huge Arab a population of Arab origins 
uh, in, in South America who fled there to get jobs and works in the 19th century and, 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 and later. And they've been very active. The Chilean football team always comes out, almost always, dressed in Palestinian colors. So you have a much greater sympathy from South America than we've had from the Arab neighbors of, uh, of, of Palestine. And it was usually thus, actually. In, uh, I mean, they can't, uh, Turkey, you know, uh, Erdogan braze a lot. But in terms of concrete actions, what do they do? Nothing. The very least they could do is break off relations. So we're not being having anything to do with you till these killings stop and your troops are out of Gaza. They can't even say that. Can, can I just interrupt? I, I want to ask, so so are you saying there is a global south still? Or can we no longer speak of a global south and instead talk about individual countries and individual leaders that happen to be in individual countries? Is there this, is there something, is there a larger international, interstate force that will protect or, or kind of join in with all the solidarity movements of, of people across the world? No. No. Okay. I don't think there is a global force that will. The reason we can't say the global south exists as it once did in the period immediately after decolonization uh, is that uh, the United States is the most powerful, most dominant country. Uh, and they don't like to break with it. I mean, they're scared to break with it. So privately, quite a few of these state leaders I, uh, Hugo Chavez once told me, he said, when I made my speech in the United Nations, denouncing the United States as a devil and uh, all this, he said, the people who rushed up to me the most were Arab leaders. He said, you know, including some from uh, the, the Emiratis and saying, thank you very much, thank you. I said, you know, I said to him, I said, Comandante, you should have said it's fine thanking me. What the hell are you doing? He said it's obvious uh, what they were doing and why <clears throat> they were doing it. And the population of the Arab world is, of course, very different. But, they, you know, I mean, they've come out, but they are partially scared. So that period of, of immediate post-colonial period is over. Now these countries have been dominated by what we called or what was called in academic and other fashion globalization which is effectively American and Western EU capitalism trying to form these countries in their own image with the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and all sorts of similar smaller uh, groups that they have uh, created. So people, you know, I mean, governments and state offices and politicians bow to that. And uh, you, you don't see this in demise. Though? You don't see that U.S.-led empire in demise, or do you? You think it's it's exaggerated? It's very exaggerated. I would love to see it in demise, and you know, many of my friends who say it is in demise, I'm sort of critical of them in public and to their faces for a lot of wishful thinking. I think the U.S. empire is way ahead of any other country in terms of uh, military strength, which is what they use more and more. They, are, they, they can't use different values because, look, that's what Gaza and the resistance in Gaza has finished off, you know, different values. So they will not defend the Palestinian people on human rights, on civil rights, on being occupied by a colonial force. They can't do that. So no one takes them too seriously now when they talk about the Ukraine, interestingly enough, because they were very strong in that. And still their politicians go on, oh, look, the wicked Russians have blown up a children's hospital in Ukraine. Yes, they have, and it's awful. But why is that any different from what the Israelis have been doing in, 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 in Gaza, on the West Bank, where they've also attacked some hospitals? So it, that feeling that the West is somehow 
good, within inverted commas, and is on the right side, which liberals had and still have, I think that has that has died a uh, death. They will try and revive it and or pretend they haven't done what they've done, but people can see through that. People uh, people aren't stupid. So on on, the, on that particular point, Tarek, um people people seeing it, I mean you, th- it's the phrase you used a while ago too, that the gloves are off or, or you know, now people can see I I think people there's a clarity of thought now, at least at the popular level. No, I don't want to exaggerate and you know be falsely optimistic and so forth, but there is a certain clarity of thought, and I don't know so much about Europe, but hopefully you can tell us more about the European situation. But for example, in the U.S., the the uprisings on college campuses, the encampments, and so forth, which have been met with the ferocious the ferocious backlash. Oh, you know the armed might of the state, basically riot police and so forth, being called out to suppress these these student protests on behalf of Palestinian rights and against Israeli genocide and against the occupation, against apartheid and so forth, which have been formative experiences for all of these students of this generation. The the repression itself suggests something. In other words, there was at one point a certain kind of hegemony that liberal Zionism could exercise in Western societies. It seems to have lost, like that hegemony is gone now. The, the the whatever Zionist narratives remain can need now the power of the state that that is the armed might of the state in the West I'm talking to back them up at least in the U S anyway to back them up you see what I'm saying so in other words that seems like while it could be seen as an index of the strength of Zionism and its official governmental supporters in the West it can also be seen as a sign of desperation and that now they can no longer take for granted the acquiescence of millions of university students now they need to they need to take stronger measures to keep you know to keep things ticking over in a way so do, but isn't that don't you see in a way isn't that isn't that sort of a sign of some kind of hope as well or what what do you think yeah it is and i think that the hegemony of the west on this particular question um has been dented quite seriously I don't think that the generations that are now in the encampments and fighting back, and it's so moving actually to see images of uh, students uh, uh, walking out of their graduation ceremonies carrying the Palestinian flag. I mean, that never happened, by the way, during the Vietnam days. Um, It was impossible. <clears throat> that is happening now. And one other difference, to just get back to Kareem's question, which is linked to this, is that we have today in Europe and North America a very large chunk, I mean, and still a min- minority of students from the Arab world of students from other parts of the global south, which we never had during the Vietnam days. You had a bit, but not as much as this. And their activism, whether they do it moderately or in a harsher way, is uh, having a big impact on those who are sort of native or uh, white Americans and and black Americans. So that's that that's a sign worth noting. But you're right. I think there has been a generational shift on this question, and I think that the Zionist narrative is being challenged increasingly, and not simply by people just coming to politics, but people who always challenged it, but didn't have the strength to come out and say so. So it's both created a new generation and encouraged a previous generation to march with them and to say, yeah, you're absolutely uh, right. I mean, what the universities have done on campuses all over. I mean, I I read uh, uh, Osama's tweets all the time. Just astonishing. It's a shamelessness what they did in uh, UCLA, what they've done in Colombia, what they're doing in other places. We will, we cannot allow this to happen. And the pattern is different, of course, but similar in 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 Britain, where they are now the new government 
is going to be much worse in trying to stop or, or uh, encourage the police to be more active in stopping displays of the Palestinian flag, etc., etc. That's worse? what. They- worse. Worse. I say they are going to be worse. Have no doubt. Worse than Cruella. Worse than Cruella. I mean, just to tell you a sort of, you know, a slightly lighter joke, I was, before one of our big demonstrations, I was asked by some radio station, the Home Secretary, Miss Suella Braverman, says that these are hate marches. What is your opinion? I said they are hate marches. We all hate her. And he couldn't reply. And, you know, that that was a feeling, but the people we have in power now, some of them are just as bad. I mean, give them a chance, they've just come into power. But for a few days or a few weeks after Labour's being in power, what do they do? They A, a guy standing on his own with a little uh, stall, with a Palestinian flag, selling Palestinian literature, is suddenly attacked by cops who come out. We've seen the images of him being beaten up brutally, his stall destroyed, the flag seized, and then they take him back to the station. That same evening, people who've seen it on their devices, hundreds of people, one shouldn't exaggerate, they were, but there were hundreds, storm to the police station, get him released and march out with him. So the reaction is is also being strong. <clears throat> and the second thing they are saying, all these creepy, crawly members of the Labour Party who were defeated by independence, the racist uh, campaign by Labour ministers is Islamophobic, without any doubt. Uh, and then they are saying they were intimidated when all that was done was basically to challenge them on Palestine. That is regarded as, and these people who've been defeated, not their victors, are being interviewed on all the television networks in Britain. So when I say they're going to be worse, I really mean it. They could be much, much uh, worse because they, they'll have a plan to try and stop it happening in five years' time. So, Tata, on on this point, can I just push a little bit, because Sadi's point about the the decline of liberal Zionism, and you seem to agree with him on that, but isn't that sort of missing the point in a sense that, yes, liberal Zionism has declined, but Europe, you know, and 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 you Tata talk about a, and we all talk about a generational shift, and there is a generational shift, as we see with the students on all our campuses, but isn't there also a generational shift to the right? I mean, you can see what's happening in Europe, you can see what's happening in many other parts of the world. Uh, and so, yes, liberal Zionism has declined. So now you have just the overt cruelty of, of you know, overt racism and genocide and, and people are totally okay with that in Europe and in, in the Republican Party and so on and so forth. So in other words, the liberal Zionism has declined, but you have a different form of Zionism, a more sort of unmasked form of Zionism. And isn't that gaining, isn't that gaining, isn't that gaining traction? But are they okay? I mean, there is resistance to it, too. It's not like there's no resistance to it. I mean, right? Well, that's but my question is, we're talking about generational shift. So I'm trying to push back on the idea of just just for the sake of discussion, there is a there's a right wing shift as well. It's not just a, it's not just a shift you know, on to the left or to. Of course, more- there is. But there's also this big difference. In the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, the liberal Zionists and even hardcore, more right-wing Zionists would never dream of supporting the far right. Now, the fact that Zionism itself has moved to the far right makes an alliance between the Zionist far right and the non-Zionist far right seem perfectly natural. And that's what's happening, which we have to comment on, that the uh, um, uh, Board of Jewish Deputies is slightly embarrassed 
when they call a demonstration in support of Israel, the fascists, actual fascists turn up and begin to sort of violently deal with pro-Palestinian demonstrators. Uh, in France, this great Nazi hunter, Serge Klasvi, publicly declared that if the choice is just between Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the leader of the left, and Marine Le Pen, he would vote for Marine Le Pen. This is what's going on. And in Germany, let's not even talk about it. I mean, the Berlin police beating up young Jewish people in the streets of Berlin because they're carrying Palestinian flags and they're saying, we're Jews. We have the right to do No, I understand that. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but isn't, isn't the point that there's a right-wing shift too that's also generational, that also has youth? Yes, it doesn't have as much of a presence as the, the left has had because the overall uh, desire of people, certainly in Britain and in France, is against this. So there are mobilizations, but one shouldn't exaggerate them. It's absolutely true that the far right is on the ascendant, but it's not on the ascendant because of Palestine particularly. It's on the ascendant because the center, the extreme center, I call it, governments, uh, have been carrying through policies which most people, poor people, working class people see are not in their interests. And one reason Mélenchon emerged uh, the victor in, in in the sense of defeating, leading the campaign to defeat, is because he raised all these issues again about pensions, about employment, attacking the core policies of neoliberalism. And so it's, it's, it's linked to that. And I think if Starmer and his uh, people do nothing, we will see a rise of the far right in this country, in Britain. I have no doubt about it. But, you know, it's there are sort of contingent reasons for it, and they're not exclusively uh, related uh, to Palestine. If anything, Palestine has forced people uh, to think. I mean, it is bizarre to see these fascists demonstrating in the streets of Europe carrying the Israeli flag. I mean... Netanyahu's not embarrassed by that at all, or his cabinet. You know, they love this support from uh, Meloni in uh, Italy and from all her equivalents elsewhere. And Marine Le Pen in France was welcomed onto the big anti-Semitism so-called uh, uh, demonstration in that country. But I don't think these people have won definitively. That's the big difference. They may do, but but we shall see. I mean, uh, uh, yes, I mean, I think the Mélenchon's victory in France, we're well, not victory, it's not exactly a victory, but his no. success in France, in any case, that's also a sign that there are there is still pushback against the right. But the other thing is, in terms of Zionism, in terms of Palestine, I mean, you were saying it, Tari, earlier in this conversation, it, the, the big support for Zionism historically in the West was on the left, it wasn't on the right. And that kept them going for 50 or 60 or whatever, 70 years, you know. Now they flipped. And as you're saying, in Europe, it's the case. And in the U.S., the strongest allies now of the, of the Zionist cause in the U.S. are, are the far right. It's not, it's not the, who are, of course, properly card-carrying, you know, anti-Semites, too. That's, that's, of course, the irony there, too. So there's, so there's a sense that the, the, old, the old system it has fallen apart. And, yes, they're trying to put it back together with this right-wing alliance, but I don't know that that's, you know, that seems to be like a big gamble, Just throwing out 70 years of history and trying to make this new alliance with people who fundamentally hate you is not, I don't know that it's a very successful recipe. It's not successful, but the very fact that it exists and is not seen as something unusual by the mainstream media speaks volumes. I mean, when the right is elected anywhere in uh, Europe, the mainstream media decides how to accommodate their readers to this. And they start treating them as if they were anyone else. This is now part of our politics. So the people have voted in the far right. We just have to uh, 
<clears throat> deal with it. I mean, it's very dangerous, actually, because what it is removing is any opposition. I mean, the recent elections in Britain, you felt they were without a soul and that there was no real opposition at all to the Conservatives. It was, as one of Murdoch's papers, The Sun, put it, just time to change the management. We need a new manager. And that's about it, really. I mean, so they came out and supported uh, Starmer. But as against that, the Starmer leadership tried its best to defeat Corbyn. They had every former leader of the Labour Party, alive or half alive, demonstrating to show Corbyn wasn't Labour. And he won with an increased majority. And and the changes in the rest of the country um, have also been, you know, where we won, the independents won, have been, have been positive. So, Tal, on this point about Jeremy Corbyn, since you raise it, maybe we can just, uh, before we wrap just as, as a question about when Corbyn was attacked as the head of the Labour Party for having an anti-Semitism problem, why did he respond in the way that he did as opposed to flat out saying this is absurd and you know this is absolutely unacceptable, this is a smear campaign, it's, this is about distraction and diversion. Instead, he seemed to go along with it and try to placate and appease and placate. And in the end, he was sort of chucked out skewed by it yeah yeah so uh, what's your thoughts because the, this these are the, the discourse of anti-semitism accusing everybody of anti-semitism including you know anyone who supports palestinian freedom is an anti-semite that's the discourse there seems to be always this 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 the reflexes to say no no i am not as opposed to saying this is an absurd accusation that was my opinion at the time we had a uh... <clears throat> big public meeting in London, and I publicly called on Jeremy. Uh, it's quite a large meeting to say this. Say, do not accept this. And whenever you tell the truth, people trust you. And he had done this because in the middle of the 2017 election campaign, the terrorists conveniently let off bombs in Manchester and London. And the whole weight of pressure uh, from within the left of the Labour Party, the so-called left, was uh, Jeremy should just denounce it and say nothing else. And he, he followed his instincts then. And he said, yeah, it is appalling, very upsetting that people have been killed, but this is a result of British foreign policy. And his conservative opponent, uh, uh, at the time, Theresa May said to people, now we've got him, we're going to destroy him. But they never raised the issue again because all the private opinion polls that they carried out, the Conservatives, showed them that 70 to 75% of the population agreed with Corbyn. And I felt he should have done the same thing. What is this? I'm an anti-Semite, you're just you, gone on the offensive. And it was a huge political error, which enabled his enemies and his, some of his so-called friends to, to give up resistance on this uh, issue. I even suggested, uh, you know, slightly provocatively, that the left produces a badge, uh, a button saying, if Corbyn's an anti-Semite, so am I. You know, just sort of hit them on the face with all this stuff. They didn't do it because they had this idea, oh, Labour's a broad church, there are many people, we should placate, placate, placate. Uh, and this is uh, this is where, <clears throat> where Corbyn ended up. The Labour people inside the party have not said too much. Some have, a few. But the bulk of them, they were 20 or 30 on Palestine. This is when they could have built a campaign inside the Labour Party on Palestine. And they didn't because some of them say we were scared of being called anti semites So you accept this slanderous campaign. Appalling. I was really very angry. Uh, at least the final question for me, which is, 
we see now in the middle of the you know, Republican convention in the U.S. and the kind of drama around Trump and the assassination attempt, which was also very strange. Um, where, you know, in in light of the the very big likelihood at this point that Trump will become president, where do you see U.S. imperialism in a sense, or the U.S. role in the global stage? Is it does it shift with Trump, or is there this kind of continuity that we've talked about? And then the second question is: Is there a is is in opposing U.S. you know for the left is opposing U.S. imperialism as the main issue mean that that one should kind of jump on board with the Russians and the Chinese and the others or is there you know because of course there's been a lot of interleft kind of fighting and that that's taking place and I think there was uh, some in the left you know talk about the the the, the stupid uh, anti imperialists you know when it came to dealing with Russia and Syria and Ukraine and other places like this so can you talk about these. Yeah. Uh, first, on Russia, China, etc. I think we judge every issue on its merits. I mean, what Putin did, in my opinion, in the Ukraine was sort of crazy, uh, the way he did it. And uh, we know his arguments, and the CIA boss, William Burns, has accepted his arguments and warned them against going too far. But still, you know, it could have been done in. Uh, in a slightly different way. And I don't agree with him, and I denounced it, just like I denounced the decision of the Russians to the, the, what they did to Chechnya, which was backed by the West. I opposed it, and many others on the, on the left did. Look, you know, on these questions, you know, there's a simple issue. You do not have to support the people in power who are under attack. Did any of us support Saddam Hussein during the Iraq war? I didn't. Many others didn't. But they didn't ask us that too much. They asked me on various television shows. And I said, no, I don't support him, but you do not have the right to remove him. His own people can remove him when they want. And these actions by imperialism make that difficult. No, we're going to remove him. So I, I am obviously opposed to all that. But I do not think the left should get into this uh, habit. Just, just because the Americans are attacking a country, it makes its leadership somehow pure. I don't accept that. And I never have. I mean, in some cases, of course, it does. I mean, the Vietnamese case was very different. Um, as far as China is concerned, quite honestly, I mean, the Chinese, in to my mind, have been quite reasonable on foreign policy. And the campaign against them by the United States is largely an economic campaign that they're scared of the fact that China has developed so quickly and so rapidly. I mean, top Americans who go there are just shattered by the Chinese cities, how they function, and they compare them to the United States where the social infrastructure is virtually collapsed. And they're saying, you know, there's all this going on. And the Americans, the American state does not want China to reach that level of moving even further. Uh, so they've been waging this campaign, calling for sanctions against stopping the sale of Huawei. It's a very aggressive policy. And on this, I would certainly defend the right of the Chinese to defend themselves against this as they, as they see fit without having any time for some of the other things they do. But that's a very clear-cut case, which takes you back, really, to the threat of war. Uh, before the First World War, when these inter-imperial contradictions were boiling up. And I think the Chinese have so far been very intelligent. I don't think they should make the mistake which Brezhnev made in the old Russia, Soviet Union, as it was then, of competing with the Americans on armaments. In that, the Americans did it to try and weaken the Soviet Union. And when Brezhnev went for it, The Economist had a headline saying, ah, the joys of rearmament, meaning now we've got you. The Chinese aren't doing that, but they are certainly capable of uh, defending themselves, and they are very popular now, except with the Indians in large parts of the uh, global global south. Um, what was your second question, Karim? On the question of Trump and where, where America goes. 
I think, look, not too much changed when Trump was elected the last time, as far as American imperial policy is concerned. I see that his new wunderkind uh, vice presidential candidate is already talking about wiping out Iraq. So what they will pro they will probably be a shift on Ukraine, since both Trump and Vance have been saying for some time that this is a crazy war and it could be stopped overnight and we're going to do it. And the reason it's carrying on is because uh, Biden refuses to negotiate a deal which the Russians are prepared to do. This is also, by the way, the view of the CIA. Uh, and sections of the American so-called secret state. Um, and so they might actually bring that war to an end, which will be a real slap in the face for the NATO powers, uh, Germany and France in particular, but they, they'll fall into line. On Israel, they'll be no different at all. Absolutely no different uh, <clears throat> at all. Unless, you know, we're about to see some big surprise. And on the rest of the world, on China, they won't be any different at all. It's the Ukraine which has worried sections of the American ruling class because they think it could get out of hand. And one reason for that is that, you know, Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons. And, you know, now it's obviously not intended too seriously. But if they provoke him too far, if he's occupied a whole country, he is capable of doing that. And then Britain, these northern islands, could just be wiped out in two days. Um, they don't think like that because they're so arrogant since they're climbing the backs. They've been on the backs of American power for so long. But I don't think the United States particularly wants that. I mean, they're not sort of crazy. Um, so on that, we might uh, see some changes. But the one thing I, I do want to say is that Biden's totally blind support for Netanyahu and the Israeli colonial regime in uh, occupied Palestine has been pretty disgusting, compared even to previous U.S. presidents. I mean, Bush the father, Truman, Reagan even, stopped the Israelis when they felt they had to do. This guy and his party seems to be in hock to them. I mean, Bernie Sanders, the sort of great white hope of the liberal left, uh, refused to condemn the, uh, didn't demand a, a ceasefire didn't wage a campaign on this issue. They've been overtaken now by the others. And I think the uh, the vote will take that into account. I mean, in Michigan, in Florida, two or three other states, in two or three other states uh, where there are large uh, or large-ish Arab populations, I don't think many of them will come out and vote for the Democrats anymore. They won't vote for Trump, but they're not going to vote for the Democrats. So you could have uh, a shift as, you know, with that as the reason as well. I just, sort of, because just, to, you know, if you hadn't seen it, Dari, Biden gave an interview in which he just said that I'm the guy who did more for the Palestinian community than anybody. Well, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. And the Zionist is about whether or not Israel is a safe haven for Jews because of their history of how they've been persecuted. Are you a Zionist? Yes. Now, now you'll be able to make a lot out of that because some people don't know what a Zionist is. Do you know what a Zionist is? I just ask questions, I don't answer. By the way, I'm the guy that did more for the Palestinian community than anybody. I'm the guy that opened up all the assets. I'm the guy that made that sure that I got the Egyptians to open the border to let good goods through, medicine. And, and food and and but what's happening is, and I'm the guy that's been able to pull together the Arab states to help agree to help the Palestinians with food and shelter. I'm the guy, and so. But this was a magazine. This was a magazine which interviewed him, and I noticed the magazine was called Complex Magazine, which was a slight misnomer. I mean. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, how can you let him? How can you let him get away with that? It's just a joke. I mean, he's delusional on many levels, and making remarks like that. I, it's just crazy. It really is. I mean, from their own, I don't care a damn, but uh, from their own point of view, the Democrats really need to get rid of him and uh, get someone else at the August convention. I thought I wanted to ask, where do you look for hope? I mean, because if we look around the, this landscape of, I mean, the, the landscape, the political landscape we've just talked about for the past hour or so, there's not much. I mean, I haven't seen inklings of hope in in your perspective, but I always think of you as somebody like I think of the left in general as as always having some kind of resource. Oh, so what are your resources for hope right now for the future? Sorry, I thought it before you answer that question. Sorry, before just as a final question to add to this, because we're we're we've reached the hour and I'm mindful of your time to answer to go along with Sadi's question. What does a new left mean today? A new new left, an actual proper left. I would say on that, that one of the things that really gave me some hope was the demonstrations in Britain and the United States on Palestine. That has never happened before. It didn't happen on this scale on Vietnam either. I mean, what made Vietnam different was the fact that the GIs came out into the streets and started protesting outside the Pentagon, which was on a different level altogether. But, you know, Americans aren't directly involved, though they've got a few people fighting with the Israelis. But the, the response to Palestine, both in Britain and the United States and in many other countries globally, has given me signs of hope that perhaps in these movements there are little seedlings which will uh, grow as time comes. And, you know, you can see them, their shape. It's not like the left used to be, but the challenge to labor from within its own ranks, uh, which lost its seats and could have lost it more seats had the left been better organized or the independents been better organized. That is a sign that there is some change. Everything hasn't come to a halt. Of course, in terms of the left or anti-capitalism, even the Mélenchon program in France wasn't anti-capitalist as such, but basically a traditional left social democratic program, which is now regarded as too much and beyond the pale because things have moved that far to the right. But um, there is nothing one can point out to. but. Uh, you know, life without some element of hope is uh, is uh, very difficult. I mean, at one point when Karl Marx's daughter and son-in-law committed suicide after going to the opera, coming back home and drinking some poison, and uh, Lenin was asked about it, saying, are we on the left opposed to suicide on principle? And Lenin said, no, not on principle, but, you know, if you feel you're of no use to the movement, there's no harm in committing suicide. <laughs> now, if one were to say that today, there would be mass suicides all over, the, <clears throat> all over the world. So there's nothing, there's nothing we can point to as such, apart, I, as I would say, the, uh, the response to an imperialist sponsored genocide in the Middle East, which the new generations can watch, and maybe something will emerge. It's there's nothing systemic, if you like, uh, which the new old new left was banking on, and which those of us involved with the new left review still argue for that unless and until capitalism is, uh, you know, really seriously dented, uh, we're, we're going to be stuck, which I think is true. And I think what is wrong sometimes is to exaggerate a situation which doesn't exist. Much better for the left to be realists from our side, you know, know what can be done, uh, 
what can't be done, what should be promoted. And, uh, you know, uh, what more can one say in these awful times? So on that note, Tare, of... Uh, on that happy note. <laughs> on that happy note of slight, slight, just a faint glimmer of optimism in the student uh, movement and also the fact of a generational shift, but also a very important call for being realistic, being sort of aware of, of the balance of power and being aware of structures. Um, we thank you so much for, for your time and for being with us and for sharing your, you know, your thoughts. Um, and we look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it... Thank you, Tarek. Thank, Thank you, Tarek. Thank you. All right, guys, that was a, a, an extraordinary discussion with Tarek Ali. A little bit on the depressing side, I would say, compared to almost all our previous uh, podcasts. And Sadi, I'd like to start with you, since you're the, 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 heart, the beating heart of optimism on this question. What do you make? How do you how do you reconcile thought it? I mean, I asked him. I, yeah, that's yeah, what that's why I asked him that last question about where do you where do you see hope? And he said that the, the hope is that it's the hope that all of us have that all of us share this extraordinary student uprising. You know that that's that that rose through the spring all through the year, came to a climax in the encampments in the U.S. and other places, including in Britain and other places in Europe and so on. In this in the spring and you know. And I, I assume, you know, we'll come back in the fall because I don't think like, we'll see where things are in the fall. But I, I assume, well, undoubtedly, and, and some of you, you have seen the article in the LA Times about the UC regions now are going to ban any kind of encampment and so on and so on. So, I mean, the repression is going to be much worse. But, of course, you know, resistance goes on. But the point is that there is, there are, I mean, so the, I guess one lesson I took from from this discussion is, and these are things we've talked about, you know, on this podcast before. But you know, he he kind of made it sharper in a way. This sense of when you look back to the 1960s, at least in, in looking either from a global perspective or in you know at, at the level of you know the West itself, you know that at, at one point it did seem possible that there could be political opposition, you know that and that you could you could replace a, a, a terrible you know, Western government with a, with a more progressive leftist kind of government. And the answer at the end of the day ends up being people like this horrible Starmer or Blair or Biden or whatever. Like this is, this is the left's answer. The exception of course is France in a way. And one would like to be, to say that, that, you know, that Melenchon, again, we have to be careful. He, it's not like he became the prime minister. He's, I doubt he will be the prime minister. It's not how the system works there. What's his name? Uh, Macron is still in charge, and you know there's there's all kinds of stuff going on there. But but nevertheless, the fact that a, there was such a strong left presence should be a sign of some kind of hope that you know that that power in some sense in in Western capitals can be taken by the left. But by and large, you know I think I I mean we've talked about this many times before. Like I you know maybe maybe we have to look to the to the people for to students for example for our sources of inspiration rather than organized parties. I don't know if that's a long, that's an ongoing discussion among the three of us and many of our guests. What did you guys think? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was also left a little bit uh, depressed <laughs> at the end. You know, you, you want you look to the hard left to to give some kind of uh, hope in a sense. Um, and he's being realistic, you know. I think it's it makes sense, you know, even based on his analysis, it, it makes sense. Uh, th there's a sense of yes, yeah, Sarah, you're talking about the encampments and and this, and even he was saying this is if you're going to find hope, that's where you find the hope. And all that's where it is, yeah. yeah, yeah. But but there's also there's also the sense of they're isolated. In other words, they're on their own. They're being attacked by university administrators. They're being attacked by Congress in the U.S. They're being attacked, by, you know, in, in the U.K. by the police and by this and by that. And the German legislation and French, you know, so the, all this stuff is going on. Uh, I just heard today, in fact, from somebody that in Morocco, somebody who went to a graduation also put on a Palestinian kind of cafe. He was also not allowed to graduate. Same thing was true in the UAE. So you, you know, you, th so there, these people are on their own. So they're doing these kinds of movements. They're doing their solidarity. But they seem to be on their own. And the question for me 
and it's maybe a question for all of us to think about is, does this generation have what it, who knows, right? But will they have the tools and the ability to kind of, to, to mature into something where they're not going to be able to rely on the old left? There's no communist party. There's no global South. There's not even, you know, there's the occasional good leader here and there. So the Colombian president today, the, the, you know, Chavez the other day, you know, so there's always somebody here and there, the South Africans today. So there's always some, some support here and there, but it's not a, it's something where they're going to have to create a new force. They're going to have to create a new logic and a new way of defining what they want in an age of, of climate change and the age of, of fascism, the age of, Trump and the age of, you know, all these kinds of things. So there's going to be a lot of things they're going to have to be dealing with. And it's going to be very, I, I think, totally unprecedented over the past hundred years, it's a totally different struggle. So I see them that they're going, that they're sort of on their own with support here and there, but they're going to have to, it's in their hands to make it or break it. Basically. That's what, that's where the hope is. I agree with Karim. I agree entirely with what you just said. I think that's probably an, an extraordinary summation because one of the points I thought it was making is the mass demonstrations today for Palestine are larger than they ever were, of course, in the 60s and 50s. In fact, they were absent in the 50s and 60s in the in the West. But the point is that with all oh, these oh, sorry, not just, not just, sorry, not just for Palestine, by the way. He was saying that, for example, the anti-war protests during the Vietnam War in the U.S., like these protests are bigger than those protests. Yeah, and but of course, the a, point big, is that a big factor in the anti-war protests in the U.S. had to do with the fact that also, Americans didn't want their soldiers to go get killed in Vietnam. That was part of yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah, 100%. You're absolutely right. But the point is that all these demonstrations have done absolutely nothing to, to change. In fact, policy has, has been more reactionary than ever before. And so the point is that we're living in a new age where, 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 where politics has become ever more corporatized, ever more sort of right. There's no responsibility. More... There's no yeah, responsibility. Yeah, there's no, exactly. They're not responsible. In the democratic the, 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 countries, there's no responsibility. Yeah. Exactly. The democratic liberal order is not. Yeah. I, you'll have seen, by the way, that t today I saw the story that, that you know, that the Starmer regime here in Britain has, has, has said now that this thing that, you know, that, that the block on the ICC arrest warrants, which was instituted by the Tories, Starmer and his, and his crew are, are reinstating that same block, basically. So like here, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. You know, like nothing, nothing has changed in that sense. So there's this, so there's this, and of course, Lamy went to Israel to take his orders and, and you know, it's, it, it's is, true. Like in that what, sense, yeah, I don't know. What I'm saying is that is the, the business of the lack of responsiveness to, to genuine democratic protests. Okay, so we're, that leaves us in a, in a different kind of order. So that we're in this kind of fascist, increasingly sort of right-wing conservative, you know, thing where their protests are taken much more seriously. It seemed then, then the protests of, as Kenny was saying, the isolated students and those who support Palestine. No, I, I, that's I would disagree with that. So I think first of all, the students are first of all, as I as I was saying to him too in this conversation, you know, the fact that there is such repression of those student protests says how how dangerous they are. In other words, when when we were protesting when we were in college, they no, they they didn't call the riot police on us because. Like whatever yes, they did. people talk. Yes, they did. No, no, no. In, in uh, on the Iraq War in two thousand three and in the nineteen nineties, they called they were... the riot police. Well, the I don't riot remember riot police. I mean, in, in I was in DC and there was massive demonstrations in DC. Yeah, but came, but and we were they, they we called, were charged they by, the, by the the by the the horses the the police horses. No, you're talking about off camp. Came. You're talking about off campus. Off, you're not talking yeah, about off campus. campus. No, I'm talking about on camp. I'm talking oh. on campus. On campus, do you remember when we were in college, where people were, were did, did, did they call the no, riot? Because nobody, nobody cared that? about Palestine back then. Nobody said a word about Palestine. That's for what I'm saying, or anything like else, that. or South Africa, or whatever. Like that, 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 that. In other words, that level of repression signals the threat that 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 these protests pose. So I or, wouldn't be, yes, so, I wouldn't right, be, so I wouldn't say it's just like oh they're on their own. No, there's something they've the, the students have hit something. You know, there's something that they've they pressed a button of some kind. And they've gotten they've gotten this ferocious reaction. Yeah, but just just to clarify, I don't understand what you're saying in the sense of an you're right, but they're not. Why are you saying they're not isolated? I mean, that's that's between that's with themselves. So within within their own solidarity encampments, their their job and their role is to is to expand that way. Uh, presumably now the summer you guys will know. I mean, it's summer break. Uh, I, I guess some of these encampments have been taken. Some of them have kind of gone off. I assume that in the fall, something will happen. We don't know. I mean, th there'll be something might happen. 
Um, but the question is, why, why are you saying it's not isolated? Why, why, why is it not isolated? I don't, that I don't understand. Because I think it's, I, I, I think it is, the, I think there are connections. First of all, just as Palestine itself, just as the question of Palestine, one reason why it's become so central to the consciousness, to the political consciousness of this, of this generation of students is that they are able to connect it in their own minds to the struggle for immigrants' rights or queer rights or a whole host of other kinds of issues, right? So there's this way in which, in which or Black Lives Matter and so forth. So there's a way in which these kinds of struggles are being connected and hence they are, they're not isolated in the sense that it's not just taking place on campus or, or that there are networks being connected, joining together what's happening that's on true. campus that's, with other kinds of struggles. Right. And that's, that's much, which is partly why they're facing the incredible repression that they're facing. In other words, they've, they've hit a nerve of some kind. It's not just, if they were as isolated as, you, as, as people are suggesting, they wouldn't, they wouldn't need the riot police. That's my point. No, but when we Sadie, protested in right, college. You're also, may, may I just get it, just because uh, you're right in the sense, Sadie, that also it's not just students isolated on campuses because you can see it on the alternative media. And the, and the number of people who are not actually students, who are actually journalists or former journalists or people, there's a whole sort of sit, world that's been opened up. And, and that is, I think, where the change, where there's hope for some kind of change. Now, last word to Karim, yeah, the just, realist. Just to clarify, not the realist, but just to clarify my point in a sense is the isolation is not in these networks. I'm saying, so I was making the point that this generation has to make that network across campuses into the TikTok videos, into the, all those kinds of communities, which are a lot of them are quite virtual in a sense, but it does build a certain kinds of network, which is what's going to be going forward. They're going to be then, uh, uh, you know, confronted with all the AI stuff that's going to come against them. Forget now Facebook and this this idiot Elon Musk and Twitter and kind of removing all Palestine kind of things and the Twitter accounts and things like this. You're going to have another wave that this that we can't even possibly imagine. That's going to that they're going to have to deal with. So it's going to be a different kind of uh, a, a different kind of resistance and a different set of networks. You, Kenny, you're, you're, you're right. You're you're right, except for the fact that that Palis, What's so different about this moment that we're in now is that Palestine has broken. There's a, a barrier that's been broken in Palestine consciousness. I think that cannot be reversed. no, and in connection, but in connection to other questions too. That's 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 the game changer. By the way, just as before we close, just to remind you, one of the stories circulating, I saw it today in the news, you know, that there's that those a couple of Delta uh, cabin crew members have been were wearing Palestine pins and then the airline denounced them. And then the, the person who denounced them got relocated in the airline. And, and now the cap, I just saw a video made by the some of the union members in the, the cabin crew, the, what are they called? The flight attendants union has now said, you know, this is out, what Delta Airlines is doing is outrageous. It's stifling our freedom of expression. And there's a big mobilization of flight. When would you have imagined flight attendants union mobilizing around, it's not directly around Palestine, although it is, it is de, de facto, it is about Palestine, about people's freedom, the ability to have freedom of expression. So there, no, are, right. there, are, right. there are things moving and circulating in a way that's, you know, I wouldn't, it's, it's, not, it's not all dark. That's my point. There's, there is hope. No, no, of course not. Of course not. One last anecdote on my favorite subject, which of course is football. And when, when the English lost in the European Championships now to Spain yesterday. Oh, the guy on Sky News, that guy? The guy the came on Sky News and he was saying, so what do you think? And the English fan was going, blah, 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 blah. And then he said, I also want to say one other thing. Free Palestine! Yeah. And the yeah. Sky guy was like, no, no, we, we don't want this. No, he said, we, we don't want any of this here. But then uh, the, if you saw the, so, uh, let me finish. If you, if you saw the social media after that, there was a big campaign to say, let's find who this guy is and let's, you know, make sure that he gets the, you know, gets the credit and, and that nothing happens to him. So, yeah. So that's very true. I agree. Guys, thank you so much. It's, it's really, honestly, it's, it's, uh, this is, I, I feel much, much more uplifted now. Uh, I felt enlightened before. Now I feel uplifted and enlightened. Thank you both.